If we've spent any amount of time in the last couple years talking about art or video games or both, then I can virtually guarantee that at some point I totally derailed the conversation to rant about how amazing Disco Elysium is, regardless of whatever it was we were talking about. First off, I do apologize, but in my defense, Disco Elysium is the kind of game that I haven't been able to stop thinking about ever since I first played it. It's groundbreaking not just in its structure and narrative design, but I think actually stands up as a capital I important work on its own. This essay is in part to shine a light on just a very small portion of that, but also to get that part of my brain that keeps turning the game over and over and over to look at it from every possible angle to just stop for at least a minute. For those of you who haven't played it, heads up, there will be spoilers later on in the video. I will warn you before we get there, not to worry. Disco Elysium centers on a murder investigation. Someone has been hanged in the courtyard behind the Whirling and Rags Hotel, and it's your job to find out who did it and why. Thankfully, the local police have sent the perfect person for the job. Detective Lieutenant Kim Kitsuragi, a conscientious, by-the-book cop, and, let's be frank, international-style icon. But you don't play as Kim. You play as his partner, Detective Harry Dubois, a train wreck of a person who just spent the last three days on a bender so intense he doesn't even remember his own name or, indeed, anything else. Your gun and badge are nowhere to be found, you have permanent DreamWorks face, and you keep telling people that you're something called Doom Cop. But, I mean, don't worry. You got this. Right? Part 1. You absolutely do not got this. As I said, Harry is a bit of a mess at the start of the game. The decades of self-loathing and alcoholism and drug abuse have not just annihilated his memory, they've totally fragmented his sense of self. Instead of skills, you have 24 aspects of Harry's personality, which will interrupt dialogue with their own opinions and form the basis of what a more conventional RPG would call skill challenges throughout the game. These run from conceptualization, which is Harry's imagination, to electrochemistry, which is his capacity for sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And even though these are all voiced by the same narrator, each has their own particular quirks. Drama, Harry's ability to lie and notice lies in others, for instance, mellifluously refers to him as sire at every opportunity, while Inland Empire, the nebulous, intuitive parts of his subconscious, well, constantly try to nudge Harry away from learning things that it knows will hurt him. It also lets him get into arguments with his tie, which sometimes he even wins. Running in parallel to this is the Thought Cabinet, a representation of the thoughts, beliefs, fixations, ideologies that Harry can pick up over the course of the game. These modify your skills, but they also determine Harry's outlook, including his political ideology. That's really important, but we'll circle back to it later. Let's just put a pin in that for now. Let's stay focused on mechanics. Like the tabletop RPGs that inspired it, the game will frequently roll checks against these skills. You'll need to pass some number of these in order to complete the main plot, but the risk of failure is still ever present. In fact, ironically, for a game that is so successful in so much of what it does, Disco Elysium is also permeated by failure. Harry has screwed up so much about his life, his job, this specific case. You are confronted at every turn with a mountain of past failures, which you're forced to learn about after the fact, bit by humiliating bit. You're given so many opportunities to apologize for Harry's past failures that the game can call you out on it, label you a sorry cop. And if you take that idea and put it in the thought cabinet, really ruminate on it, lay into yourself, you come to the conclusion that, above all, you let life defeat you. All the gifts your parents gave you, all the love and patience of your friends, you drowned in a neurotoxin. You let misery win. And it will keep on winning until you die or overcome it. The years of drugs and depression have left Harry's psychological and physical state incredibly fragile. Sometimes the slightest setback can mean that his body or his mind just give out on you. I mean, you can die because a chair is so uncomfortable that you have a heart attack. But whether Harry just can't take the psychic torment of his job or gets so wrapped up in an argument that he puts a loaded gun in his mouth and pulls the trigger just to prove a point, 
it's pretty easy for him to let life defeat him. But while failure absolutely is an option, it's not the only option. It's possible to beat the game, solve the case, stop drinking, start putting in the long, hard work of putting what's left of Harry's life back together. But Harry is going to fail along the way. With so many skill checks and possibilities for failure, you won't experience all of them in a single playthrough, but the failures of your run are going to stick out. In one of my run-throughs of Disco Elysium, I deliberately stopped and restarted from a previous save, not because I failed a skill check, but because I succeeded. I've never done that before. It was very early on, when Kim asks for your name and Harry realizes, oh god, he's forgotten. If he succeeds a conceptualization skill check, he realizes that he has genuinely no idea what his name is. Sorry. He can be vague and ominous and say that it isn't really time for him to reveal his name, but he can also just admit that somehow he's forgotten. If he fails, though? Oh my god. If he fails, his brain confidently returns the name Rafael Ambrosius Custo. Now, that's not his name, but he can confidently claim that it is against all evidence to the contrary. I mean, he can't keep up the facade forever, right? But given that his liver looks like an aerial shot of the Somme in 1916, it's not like he has to keep up the lie for too much longer anyway. Harry's past is going to catch up with him one way or another. In that way, he's quite a lot like his surroundings, the city of Revachal itself, more specifically the pornographically poor harbor district of Martinez where the game entirely takes place. Revachal is Harry in macrocosm. Dysfunctional, divided, broken down by forces that are both beyond its control, and also direct consequences of its actions. When the game begins, there isn't even really a Revachal to speak of. Instead, the city is occupied by an international coalition. The communist revolution that took place 48 years before the game begins was brutally crushed. The coalition troops actually used Martinez as a beachhead during the invasion. They shelled the upper floors of a nearby apartment building to rubble just because it was in the way of them shelling everything else. Over the course of several decades of occupation, the communists were systematically exterminated. Revachal never really recovered. Its shell craters, bullet holes, shuttered businesses all mirror the physical damage done to Harry's body by years of self-destruction. Harry's mind is broken up into its constituent parts, and Revachal is divided into zones of control. They're both also defined by their pasts, even if Harry can't remember his and Revachal can't forget. The scars endure either way, and for both Harry and all of Revachal, the past may just end up tearing them apart. Spoilers, incidentally, from this part forward. You have been warned. Part 2. Inland Empire. Content warning, by the way, for this next section uh, for depression, drug abuse, and suicide. If you'd rather not deal with any of that, uh, you go ahead and jump to this timestamp here. Okay? The very first choice in Disco Elysium is self-annihilation. Harry begins the game not just asleep, but as close to non-existent as it's possible for a conscious mind to get. His ancient reptile brain is egging him on to just slip into the void. It's a false choice. You can't actually really choose to stop existing. Not yet. The sound of Kim's car outside is going to wake Harry up no matter what, and so the game will begin. Harry lurches to his feet, his memory completely erased. Well, not completely. It's more accurate to say that Harry's memories are siloed off. Encyclopedia stores all of his conscious memory about the world at large, for instance. I mentioned the skill Inland Empire earlier, and it's worth unpacking a little bit to get at what makes the character of Harry Dubois so interesting and tragic. Inland Empire isn't just Harry's sense of the supernatural, like getting life advice from his awful necktie, or speaking to a murder victim from beyond the grave. It's also the voice of Harry's subconscious memory. That subconscious stores all of the pain and grief and shame in Harry's past, and it will loudly object to any of its contents being investigated. Harry will just be humming along, working on the case, when suddenly he finds an apricot bubblegum wrapper and Inland Empire will say, no, 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 abort, you do not want to know what this means. I know it, and it sucks. 
And it's usually right. Nine times out of ten, whenever Inland Empire tells Harry not to remember something, it's because the knowledge will inflict actual psychic damage on him. You ignore it, and all of a sudden one of your dialogue options reads, Just fucking kill yourself, you asshole. But you aren't curious what that's all about, right? I mean, what, are you not going to turn over every rock in Harry's subconscious to find out how he got to be this way? This is an RPG. Learning about the world is half the game. I mean, scratch that. In Disco Elysium, it's the entire game. There's no combat. There's no puzzles unless you count talking to Egghead. There's just memory. What's more, Harry's a detective. Looking into the past is what he does even when it completely destroys his body and his mind. The tragedy of Harry Dubois is that even forgetting everything can't save him from the basic pathological instinct to remember. It can't save him from you, the player. So pretty much inevitably you learn that the painful memory that Inland Empire is trying to steer you and Harry away from is the memory of Harry's ex, Dora. She and Harry had been engaged years ago before the stress of his work, Harry's depression and alcoholism, and the slow collapse of the ideal versions they had built of one another caught up with him. Dora broke off the engagement left both Harry and Revachal behind. If Harry's drinking had been bad before, it became apocalyptic after that. The nickname that the other officers of Harry's precinct give him, Tequila Sunset, means someone who's drinking himself to death. I mean, that said, none of the cops that Harry interacts with seem especially happy. One of them even flat out admits he's clinically depressed. Even Kim, who has his shit exponentially more together than Harry does, has a tired, frustrated dignity about him. Being a detective is a terrible job, not just because of the hours or the pay, but because it involves probably the single most destructive human tendency, fixating on the past. Harry was worse off than most. When you review his case file, you realize that at one point, he was a very efficient detective. He cleared a caseload twice the size of his colleagues, losing himself in his work to try to escape the pain of his failed relationship. But we can see now why that was never going to work. In trying to escape the past, all he ended up doing was burying himself in it deeper and deeper. It was only a matter of time before he turned that gaze inward and destroyed himself in the process. Fixating on the past, especially on the parts of it that hurt us or we're ashamed of or that only make us miserable to think about, or all of the above, is a poison that eats away at the human soul. Speaking of poison, let's talk about fascism. Fascism is a loser ideology, and I mean that in more ways than one. It's fundamentally about loss, real or perceived. A fascist has to feel like they've lost something. Prestige, respect, purity, something. It's not surprising that fascism might appeal to Harry, not just because he's a cop. He's at his lowest ebb. He's hurt. He's angry, he's at the bottom of a bottle. He's the perfect fascist recruit. Fascism offers an easy answer to all of your suffering. The world has clearly gone to shit, and it's all because of, well, everyone but you, really. The very first line of the thought that lets Harry adopt fascism as a political ideology is, they've fucked this place. But saying and doing fascist things when Harry goes fash actually hurts him because well, fascism isn't actually an answer. It's not even a coherent ideology. Fascism is a gut instinct, an outward projection of a death-seeking flaw in human programming. It doesn't make sense on an intellectual level because that's not the level it operates on. When Harry first entertains the idea of becoming a fascist, he's contacted by his endurance. Again, literally, fascism is coming from his gut, not any of his mental or emotional faculties. Most of the fascists you meet over the course of the game, from the shithead racist truck driver to René the old loyalist soldier, don't really articulate their view of the world in intellectual terms. Even René, the most sympathetic out of all of them, mainly just seems bitter that the woman he loved chose to marry someone else. The one person who tries to intellectualize fascism is a 6 foot 6 eugenicist bodybuilder named Measurehead. Measurehead, as you can probably imagine from the name, is a big fan of phrenology, the pseudoscience of measuring people's personalities and intelligence by their skull shape. He will explain, at length, how people like Harry, the am sandwich race, 
should be crushed in a giant race war so that his people can reign supreme. You need to find a way to get past him in order to proceed with your investigation, which you can do either by physically confronting him, and uh, good luck with that, or by attempting to internalize his weird racist worldview. Now, if you haven't played Disco Elysium before, or you've just forgotten, take a guess what skill you need in order to do this. Is it logic or encyclopedia, you know, your knowledge of the world? No, it's conceptualization. Make-believe, in other words. Measurehead is the most quote-unquote scientific racist you'll ever meet, and you still need to indulge in literal fantasy to take his ideas seriously. So you've done the smart thing and decided, hey, fascism isn't for you. Sure, you could become a hyper-capitalist instead, but what about something a little bit more... radical? That's right, everybody, it's time to talk about the game's real selling point, the most popular political ideology by far, according to Steam, becoming a communist. Being a communist is great. I mean, you get to have big dramatic revolutions. You get to call your boss a capitalist pig. You get a holistic picture of all of the ways that you and everyone around you are being crushed into nothing by a vast and caring economic superstructure. And everyone you know who dared to dream of a better future was murdered by the combined armies of the entire rest of the world. And now the idea of a better society has turned to ash in your mouth. Okay, granted, being a communist actually kind of sucks. It's kind of like a trolley problem, except instead of being able to switch the trolley over to just the one person, all you can do is helplessly stand back and watch as the trolley runs over millions upon millions of people until it eventually destroys the entire world. Harry becoming a communist may not have the same spiritual toll as him becoming a fascist, but sure as hell didn't make him happy. As a matter of fact, all he has managed to do is make himself sad. He's starting to suspect Krasmazov fucked him over personally with his socioeconomic theory. It has, however, made him into a very, very smart boy with something like a university degree in truth. Instead of building communism, he now builds a precise model of this grotesque, duplicitous world. There isn't much of an organized left in Revishal. The closest things are basically a crime syndicate, a couple of grad students in a reading group, and a bitter, traumatized sniper. Nobody even takes Communist Harry seriously because why should they? As a member of the Revachal Citizens Militia, he's quite literally an agent of capital. As the game puts it, it's as if people don't believe a cop would be a socialist revolutionary. The real communists are dead. Only their ghosts remain. Harry sees them everywhere in the mortar craters of the Rue saint gislain and the bullet holes in the boardwalk. So if the communists are all dead, who survived? Part 3. Love for a face. The first sign, in my opinion, that there's something deeply weird about the world of Disco Elysium comes fairly early on when you learn about the existence of the Pale. The Pale is an eldritch zone of unreality, not unlike the Shimmer in the movie Annihilation or the Zone in the film Stalker and the games that are based off of it. Reality breaks down in the pale, and people who are exposed to it begin to lose their minds. Oh, and also it covers most of the planet, and it's growing. You learn right at the end that the pale is made up of decaying human thought, like radioactive fallout. To put it another way, it's made up of the past. In that sense, the pale serves as Disco Elysium's central metaphor. The past will drive you crazy, and the actions humanity has taken in the past will eventually consume the world. At the same time, I do want to caution against an overly literal reading of this. I'm not saying the pale is literally what sent Harry down his personal depressive spiral and wiped his memory. Rather, think of these two things as running in parallel. There's nothing that can be done really to make the pale go away. It's a function of human thought. We're going to have to get used to it. And humanity has gotten used to it, forming ideologies that fathom the randomness and chaos of the world into a coherent narrative. In that sense, detectives, theologians, historians, and political theorists all have fundamentally the same job, taking isolated facts and pulling them together into something useful to answer questions about the world. Why was the hanged man killed? Why did the revolution fail? What is there to live for? Revachal doesn't have satisfactory answers for any of those questions. 
on the surface, it looks like liberal capitalism won. The revolution was crushed, the various center-left and center-right countries that made up the coalition have been doing a four-decade victory lap slash killing spree in the ruins. But they didn't build anything to fill the space that communism left behind. All of the warm, friendly trappings of liberalism are still there, but they're hollow, like an abandoned church. The DeLorean Church of Humanity, off on the bottom left end of the map, might be my favorite part of the game. It was built hundreds of years ago by the very first people who crossed the Pale to found Revachal. It's dedicated to an innocence, a religious slash historical figure who emerges every so often and forces humanity through hundreds of years of social and political development in a single lifetime. This innocence's name was Dolores Day. She was the innocence of humanism, liberalism, and the modern world. This church is the only one of its kind left. Most of the others were destroyed during the revolution. DeLoreanism and the ideals that it embodied gave humanity one way of dealing with the pale, through the spiritual power of the church, the political power of liberalism, and the material power of capitalism. But these three things are also internally contradictory. How do you square individual human rights or spiritual community with an economic system that atomizes and exploits people? How can you have a democracy if some people are wealthy enough to just buy the laws that they want? Joyce Leighton Messier, the game's stand-in for liberal capitalism, is pretty candid in admitting that you really can't. The contradictory parts of liberal ideology annihilated each other, leaving only capitalism behind. Dolores Day was eventually assassinated by her own bodyguards, and hundreds of years later, her church be destroyed from within too. Now that's all well and good for capitalists, except that in not providing any higher meaning for people than the nihilistic, shark-like pursuit of growth and profit, they've also not given humanity anything to keep the pale at bay. Here I'm actually being metaphorical, but also literal. There literally is a pocket of the pale up in the rafters of the church being contained by the structure itself. That's why it was built here specifically. And then you realize, wait a minute. What was that you said about all of the other churches having been destroyed? The thing is, even if Harry somehow rebuilt all of the old DeLorean churches, it wouldn't be enough. The belief itself that built those churches is dead. The magic is gone. She's gone, Harry. She left you and Revachal, and she's never coming back. Gone but for an old love letter and the sweet smell of apricots. <sighs> okay, I've danced around it long enough. Let's talk about that scene. You can actually miss it altogether if you don't take a nap when Kim suggests that you have a minute to rest in the final area. If you do sleep, though, Harry has a dream in which he sees Dora taking the form of Dolores Day. The idealized version of his former partner and the living embodiment of a dead future blur into each other, switching perspectives line by line. It doesn't matter how much Harry pleads with Dora to take him back, it's over. It's been over for years, you can't ever go back. Harry realizes, if he hasn't yet, why their relationship fell apart. His drinking, his intense depression, his belief that every conversation follows some kind of a dialogue tree. Hey, wait a minute, now this isn't Dora, or Dolores. This is a dream. Harry is talking to himself. He's alone, clinging to the fading memory of a woman that he loved so desperately, but never enough to fully understand her. No matter what he does, he can't ever recover the version of the future that he and Dora had together. No sooner does Harry realize that than Dora, or Dolores, or Harry tells him real darkness has love for a face. The first death is in the heart, Harry. See you tomorrow. I know there have been a lot of superlatives in this video already, but this moment, being trapped in a dream and forced to confront a future that will never come no matter what you do, might be the single most existentially bleak moment I've ever experienced in a game. I cried the first time I played through this conversation. I can think of few better depictions of the absolute deepest depths that the human mind is capable of than the voice of someone you love speaking with the authority of God herself, 
telling you that the pain that you're feeling right now will go on forever, that it is inevitable, that there is no alternative. But what if there is? Part 4. Acid Communism There's a term that gets thrown around in leftist spaces a lot, hauntology. It was originally coined by Jacques Derrida, and it really loses a lot in translation. In the original French, it's a pun, because it sounds like the word for ontology, ontologie, whereas in English, it sounds like you're no fun at parties. Derrida initially used the term hauntology in a philosophical sense, referring specifically to something that would be prematurely called the end of history in the late 90s, which we don't really have time to get into now, other YouTubers have covered it at length, I don't have a lot to contribute that hasn't already been said better. For our purposes, let's settle on a quick and dirty, oversimplified definition. Hauntology is a reminder of what it was like to imagine a future unlike the world you live in. If you can imagine a future, especially a better future, you might just start to believe that you could change the present. Disco Elysium leans hard on that word, believe. If you talk to the grad students in the communist political quest added in the final cut of Disco Elysium, they'll tell you their theory that revolutionary fervor itself produces something called plasm that can bend the laws of physics. If we just think communist thoughts really, really hard, we can make plants grow twice as fast, we can read minds, we can build impossible buildings. The students have been trying for ages to prove this in practice, building an impossible tower out of matchboxes. It always falls. And like, in a literal sense, that's obvious, right? I mean, what did you expect? You're, you're literally attempting the impossible. But is the idea that belief can change the world in and of itself wrong? Our world was made by people, and it can be remade by people, too. The entire world, both ours and Disco Elysium's, are on the brink of a catastrophe that defies all understanding. Are, are we supposed to just lie down and die? On the left, we get so caught up in correctly diagnosing the problems of the present that we forget that we need to inspire people to imagine a vision of the future as well. We have to teach people to believe in the impossible. For now, let's go back to that abandoned church. When you first find it, it's being fought over by Suna, a researcher studying the patch of pale up in the rafters, and a gaggle of ravers who want to turn the church into a nightclub dedicated to avant-garde electronic music. In order for them to do that, though, you'll need to convince Suna to conduct her research alongside the nightclub, and you'll need to conveniently ignore the fact that, realistically, the only way the club could stay open is if it's also a drug front. In the process, you'll need to talk to one of the ravers, a guy calling himself Egghead. That's harder than it sounds, since he responds to everything you say with things like Hot caught as a mega and internally coherent. He is the best character. More than anyone else for a reason I can't even entirely explain. I feel like I know this guy. Like I've had this exact conversation with somebody way too drunk or high to be on the same level of reality as I'm on. Hell, this is probably what I sound like when I talk about Disco Elysium to people who haven't played it. Egghead will send you on a side quest to make his music truly hardcore. It's not a very long quest, but finishing the Raver's music might actually be the most consequential thing Harry does in the entire game. It's important that the Ravers are specifically making electronic music. Synthesizers totally transformed what kinds of sounds music can be made of. They changed our foundational assumptions of what music can even be. It was its own kind of revolutionary act. And in letting Harry help bring the Ravers music into the world, this one side quest lets Harry build an indispensable part of confronting the past and imagining a future. Art. Encyclopedia can tell Harry that the sailors who first crossed the Pale and discovered the Isola where Ravishal is now located developed a kind of mental discipline in order to keep their sanity. It's described as having been like the composition of poetry. Art is how we confront the past and imagine a future. Whether it's poetry on a creaking ship sailing off the edge of a map, or blasting some Arno van Eyck in the church of a dead goddess. At the risk of overreaching, I think there's a meta-textual element to this as well. The game's lead designer, Robert Kurvitz, has talked in interviews about his struggles with depression and alcoholism before creating Disco Elysium, which I'm sure is at least in part why the writing in the game about both is so achingly real. 
I sincerely hope that writing the almost one million words of Disco Elysium script helped in some way. But at the same time, write one of the most narratively ambitious video games of all time would be terrible advice. I mean, that's not a realistic goal for everyone, just on a practical level. Even if we can solve all of our personal issues with some combination of medication, art, and therapy, we live in a world that rations all of those things extremely harshly for the overwhelming majority of people. So, if we want a better world but don't want to get the absolute shit kicked out of us again, where do we go from here? He says as though he didn't title this section Acid Communism. That's right, folks, it's Acid Communism! By acid, social critic and political theorist Mark Fisher meant both, yes, LSD, but also perspective-altering experiences more generally. Class consciousness is a psychedelic idea. I mean, think about it, you're perceiving something about the interconnectedness of the world which your limited human perception and or the hegemonic capitalist ideology you were raised in didn't let you see. The point of a phrase like acid communism is to evoke the kind of shift in consciousness that the left should embrace. As Fisher himself notes, art is also a psychedelic experience, especially art that makes us think about our place in the world, about how we interact with one another, and about how the world around us can change at any time if enough of us decide to change it. There's a reason there is a strong radical tradition in the arts, especially in things like music and theater. We can get up out of our seats, out of the shell craters, and take the future back. That, I think, is the ultimate genius of Disco Elysium. Everything from the fail states, to the political commentary, to the many voices in Harry's head challenge what an RPG even could be, in the same way that synthesizers transformed what music could be. Disco Elysium startles you awake to the enormous possibilities of what a game can even be. It's a little microcosm of revolutionary clarity. The pale may surround us all, and everyone who tried before us may have failed, but we still have time to try to make the impossible a reality. A little ways northwest of the crime scene is a blank wall that Harry, with enough conceptualization, can decide to paint a mural on. On my first playthrough, I put, fuck the police, because, I mean, you know, a cap. Kim got annoyed, it was a funny little moment, I didn't really think much of it, and moved on. On a later playthrough though, as I spent more and more time with Harry in this maybe doomed world, when I went back there, another message caught my eye. So in 20 foot letters, on the side of a Revishal tenement, I wrote, something beautiful is going to happen. Mm -hmm.